much for logging on. And for those of you guys who are going to be watching afterwards, potentially, thank you so much for taking the time to view this. We're really excited to share some information about potential ag careers and how you can get into ultimately some really cool digital careers and maybe even starting out now as high school students. So without any further ado, uh, of course, my name is Carrie Wilmsmeyer. I am a professor and director of the Center for Predictive Analytics at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. But there is a long winding path that led to ultimately that career. Uh, as a quick bit of background, I did do my undergrad in horticulture plant soil science at the University of Kentucky, which means that I do have a little bit of a Southern accent. So for those of you guys who are attending live, if there is something I say, and it's like, what in the world did she just say? Feel free to stop me. I am more than happy to go back and try to make that accent disappear a little bit. After I wrapped up my degree at the University of Kentucky, I went to the University of Illinois and got a degree in plant breeding and genetics. All right, so let's go to the next slide. For those of you guys who are attending live, we would love to learn a little bit more about you and potentially tailor this presentation to you guys and your interests. So if you guys are attending live, what are your career interests? What part of Illinois are you coming from? Northern, Central, Southern, Western? And what year in school are you? Are you a freshman potentially who is just starting to think about maybe what kind of careers are out there? Are you a senior who's getting ready to graduate? A junior who's starting to think about college and how to get into technical ed? Let us know. We love to learn all about you guys. Uh, and again, I, I will never ask you guys information that I wouldn't willingly give about myself as well. Uh, so, of course, I'm down in southwest Illinois these days, but I've lived a little bit all over. All righty, so just waiting a couple of minutes. All right, got our poll in. Thanks so much. We're going to keep on going on right now, it looks like. So, Carrie, we just put the poll up. I apologize. Oh. No, so no, the no, poll no, no. Just, the poll just went up and people are voting right now. Thank you guys for keeping me on the straight and narrow. Okay, so we're going to end the poll. We've given everyone about 45 seconds, and then we will share the results with everyone. Perfect. Looks like we got some folks who are looking at four years, some folks who are looking are a little bit undecided. We'll look. We'll talk about it both. Um, you know, what's kind of fun is in this long winding path that I've taken to kind of get here. I've gotten to see a little bit of both sides. So. As I mentioned, how in the world did I get here? You know, whenever you go back and you start talking about your experiences and how you got to where you are, a lot of times when you take that long reflective look, it looks like a really straight and narrow path. I had an interest in agriculture. I wound up taking on a tech job whenever I was in high school uh, as a summer job and then also worked during the school year um, where I was helping a cattle operation take records and I was doing some financial accounting for them as well as field labor. I loved it so much I went ahead and got a bachelor's degree in agriculture and then I went ahead and got a PhD because I really loved it so much and then that ultimately led to my career in digital agriculture. I mean it seems like it's really straightforward right? It wasn't. There were a lot of options and opportunities and as well as opportunity costs all along the way. It was really this winding path where there were a lot of diverging forks in the road and I said, you know what, let's go with this opportunity. Or I go with this opportunity. I look back on that now and I can see it. But at the time it was like, hmm, let's just try this out. 
And that's really everybody I've ever talked to that winds up in a ultimately an ag career or a digital ag career, especially in digital careers in general. That's where we wind up usually looking back on our careers and saying, it was a lot of opportunities where we were going this way or that way. And we didn't realize it at the time, but it was actually really fundamental for us to take those opportunities and use them to our advantage. So like every single teenager I know out there, I needed a job when I was in high school, wanted a little bit of extra spending money. Let's be honest, I wanted a car, I wanted to pay insurance and gas money. And so I started working and keeping records for a purebred cattle farm that was near where I grew up. So I'm, I'm from Western Kentucky. I grew up in this area, this little town called Princeton. Uh, again, if my accent starts coming out, feel free to say, hey, can you slow down a second? Can you go back and say that again? Um, you know, I was keeping financial records for them, pedigree records for them, was helping to upload those pedigree records to, I was working with Gelby Cattle, so the American Gelby Association, and, you know, I loved it, and of course, I was doing all this in addition to helping to feed the cattle, you know, doing some hay work, all kinds of fun things, so the question I always get asked was, well, why do they hire you? You were just a high school student. Well, let's be honest, I was cheap. Um, I was just a high school student. I did not require benefits. Um, I only was working part time. I just wanted gas money, basically. And, you know, the community I worked in was amazing. The, the community I grew up in, for that matter, was amazing. It was incredibly supportive of students and getting them into career and tech ed positions early on so they could kind of get their feet wet and start learning what they did and didn't like about those areas, whether it was in ag or it was in mechanics or whatever the case might be. And the other thing too was, you know, it was really interesting. Uh, whenever I was growing up, my, my mom actually has a degree in computer science and business management. So I was always kind of looking over her shoulder a little bit. And I think she was indoctrinating me from an early age to love playing with Excel and its precursors. And, you know, what was interesting is I was not afraid of computers. And I love to tinker, which was not something that a lot of the cattle operation that I was working for, or the cattle operations that area saw very frequently. So it's like, hmm, she's cheap. She likes working with computers. She can keep records. Yeah, we'll, we'll give her a chance. And I loved it. So again, I started working on this cattle operation. Didn't know how it was going to turn out. I just wanted gas money. Fell in love with it so much, I actually turned it into my SAEP or Supervised Agricultural Experience Project. Um, the farmer that I was working with uh, actually just needed an extra set of hands for organizing pedigrees. And again, because I grew up in this really supportive community, he was like, yeah, sure, you can help out and I'll pay you a little bit for your time. And then what happened was he realized that my method of organizing everything and keeping track of those records made everything easier with talking to the AGA, the American Gelby Association. So he said, you know what, why don't you just do it? I like your method better. Hey, while you're at it, do you think you can put these receipts in order? Sure. You know what? You're paying me and it means that I get paid on days where it's raining and I don't have to go outside on those icky days. Sure. So I put that together, got all the financial records put together. And he's like, well, you know what? This actually looks really cool. Do you think you can air, uh, identify areas where I can cut costs? Sure. I'll tinker with it, figure out what I can do. And whenever all of these conversations across several different years took place and I come back, I would tinker and come back with information that was helpful to him. He would say, you know what? I have this issue with some of my cattle where some of them are going in and they have behavioral traits I don't necessarily like. And I know it's genetically controlled. Can you figure out which sires are potentially causing the problem? Sure, I can do a pedigree analysis and try to do a trace back. That sounds fun. And so that was really not a singular moment where I'm getting all of these skill sets. They were all building. It was all of uh, these random little projects of, you think you can do this? Sure, I'll try. And I tell people this all the time, and I don't think they believe me. Those skill sets that I learned as a high school student, I use every single day as a data analyst now of going into data, being able to mine through it, being able to organize it in a way that I can keep track of it and then take that data and turn it into action items. It was actually really fun and very eye-opening to how you can use data to help out operations. So I, I said a, an acronym a second ago, SAEP, and you're probably sitting there and it's like, 
you just said you are a director of the Center for Predictive Analytics. I mean, you're a data scientist. So you're a data scientist and you're a professor at SIUE and you were at FFA? Yeah, I was actually, uh, we uh, organized things a little bit differently in Kentucky where I'm from. I was a regional officer, loved it, had fun. And this is one of those little career opportunities, one of those little pathways that I was talking about that was incredibly fundamental for me because, you know, I'm learning all of these technical skills in my SAP job or SAP project and in my job, but I didn't necessarily learn those interpersonal skills through that. I, of course, I knew how to work with people. I knew how to work in teams, but I didn't necessarily know how to interact with large groups. That's what I got from, S, uh, from FFA. And I knew how to organize and present things in a manner that I could get people excited about the work that I was doing. Uh, I use that all the time as a director and as a manager now. Um, and of course, I gained extra technical applications too. I worked in the greenhouse, got to work with sales, got to work with customer relations. It was fantastic. And I also had wonderful mentors who were there and who were able to help me and help guide me along the way. Um, both of them who honestly realized that I had this love for science and this love for agriculture and said, hey, let's see if we can bring those two together and help you along your way. And we're introducing me to all kinds of different little opportunities where I could potentially merge those two loves together because everything I had seen at that time was you have to be a scientist or you have to be an agriculturist. I'd only seen production act, um, which is fun and lovely, fantastic. But I was wanting to do something more science related. So I've been told, hey, you probably want to go be an engineer. Well, engineering's cool, but it wasn't necessarily something that I had thought about. Well, maybe I can bring in both this love for data and this love for science and potentially bring it into and merge with ag until I had these mentors who helped to show me that to some degree. And again, because of that, one of those opportunities that they pointed me toward was something called the IFL, which stood for our program, which stood for Institute for Future Agricultural Leaders. It was offered through uh, the Kentucky Farm Bureau. Uh, and what was interesting was this program was a partnership with multiple campuses in Kentucky to give promising new ag students a chance to see what college in an ag program might look like, as well as an ag career and what that might look like. Um, by chance, I was assigned to the University of Kentucky. Now, Let's put this in perspective, by the way. I grew up in this little town called Princeton, Kentucky. This is a screenshot of Princeton today, all 6,500 residents of it. It's a little tiny. But, uh, the University of Kentucky is dead center in Lexington, Kentucky, which just the city itself has a population of 300,000. The metro area is a little bit bigger. As you can see, blow, you know, zooming out, I still could barely capture all of Lexington. This little farm girl, this little itty bitty small town girl was not entirely crazy about this. I was absolutely terrified. Not to mention that it was on the opposite end of the state. Those people were, you know, very, uh, there's a little bit of a cultural difference. Um, Western Kentucky is very different from Central Kentucky. As I'm sure you guys have seen, you know, Chicago is very different from Southern Illinois, both great places, but there are some differences. And I was out of my element. And, you know, what was interesting was I had a ball. I had been hoping I would have been placed in one of the smaller colleges because I wasn't, I still wasn't planning on going and getting a degree in ag. I, I was planning on getting a degree in chemistry or biochemistry or something like that. And then going on and getting a med degree or, and becoming a doctor or maybe going on and doing engineering and becoming a biochemical engineer or something along those lines. That was, those were my career plans. But what was interesting is whenever I got to Lexington, it was actually on UK's campus, I realized I, I had fun. It was fantastic. I actually made some lifelong friendships, some people I stay in contact with these days now. And I also realized something about their programs in comparison to the small liberal arts colleges that I've been looking at. Because I, I was thinking, oh, I need this really small community. Um, that'll be more reflective of where I'm from. I'll be more comfortable in that environment. Um, what was interesting, though, is whenever I got onto UK's campus, I realized that all their programs were something I craved. They were all applied. Um, I love theory. Don't get me wrong. It's pretty cool to learn about new things. But for me, it was always one of those things where I needed to see the application. And what was also really cool, and part of the reason I put this screenshot up here, was remember me saying I wanted to go and be a doctor, like a medical doctor, potentially? Well, this little building right here that has the octagon attached to it, this is UK's College of Agriculture. 
This building right here is their hospital and their college of medicine complex. UK's College of Agriculture realized this and actually created a degree at that time called Agricultural Biotechnology. Today it's Agricultural Medical Biotechnology where they were actually training most of the med students. So I'm sitting here like, I can actually stay in an ag type community for four years to get a degree and then go to med school? Sign me up, that sounds fantastic. I loved the people I was working with. I loved the progress and how applied they were. You know, that's, that's how I wound up at UK. And if I hadn't, if I had not taken that one week to go and learn about those different types of programs through Eiffel, I would not be in the spot I am now. I would have had a completely and totally different career trajectory. So, you know, one thing that I wanted to mention to you guys too was, you know, four-year colleges, they're expensive. I'll be completely and totally honest with you guys. There, there's no getting around that. And so as a student who was coming from a very blue collar family, um, you know, be honest with you guys, I, I had to pay my way through school. There was no, there was no help otherwise. And I know many students are in that same situation. And so what I did to make that college experience more affordable was for all of your courses, whenever you are going into college and if you're thinking about a four-year degree, one of the things you can do to bring your costs down is get your gen ed courses out of the way. So your histories, your arts, your general sciences, all those types of courses. And so by the time that I graduated high school, what I had done was I was, I was almost a junior in college by that point. I had all of my gen ed courses, so all my histories, all my arts, most of my basic sciences already taken care of through AP type courses and dual credit courses through the local community colleges and all of them transferred over to the University of Kentucky. Now there were a couple of courses I think like physics I had to finish up um, but I took those over at Bluegrass Community and Technical College which was literally down the road from UK so it all worked out great. Um, and then there were a couple that I still took through UK because they were really good and very integral to my major. I started out in the pre-med track you know, I'm still sitting here thinking, oh, I'm going to be a doctor at the end of this. I, I really love medicine. I really love genetics. I loved that aspect of whenever I was working with the cattle farm, I was working with the pedigree records, and I was majoring in agricultural biotechnology. Again, now agricultural medical biotechnology because UK's College of Agriculture recognized what they had and were preparing people to actually go into med school or dental or something along those lines. Now, about halfway through, I was actually home for Christmas and my mom, she's the most artistic human being on the face of the planet as far as I'm concerned. Me, I can barely draw, draw a stick person, seriously. I did not inherit her artistic abilities. Whenever I'm home or whenever I was home over Christmas, I, I kid you not, still to this day, you walk in, you think you're at Santa Claus's workshop, seriously. So she's up on a ladder putting stuff up. I'm helping hand her stuff and she drops a glass ornament, tries to catch it with her leg. Didn't that go well? Well, as soon as I'm helping her, you know, make sure she's okay and realize that she's okay. I realized, you know, there's a lot of blood. I don't like blood and almost fainted right there. And she had two people to take care of herself as well as me. Um, so blood and guts, not my thing. You don't want a doctor who's gonna faint on you. Figured I might need a different career trajectory, but I still loved genetics. And what was interesting was because I had loved working with data so much, somehow I managed to take math and stats classes for fun. Um, I, it always was just one of those courses where I'm like, you know, I need a, I need a STEM course. I like math and stats. We'll do it. And what was interesting was I had a couple of professors who said, you know, you can bring those two together, right? And do something like plant breeding. And that's what I wound up doing and going to grad school for. But it was me coming in and having the good classes and having the decent grades enough to get me into a good grad program? Uh, no. Not in the slightest. You still have to have all of these applied experiences if you want to make the most of your undergraduate education. So I was participating in things like the Ag Student Council, which was very similar to FFA in terms of how it worked, or, you know, from high school, and the Ag Ambassadors Program. And through Ag Ambassadors, I had yet another great mentor whose name was Jason Hedrick. And we were working on, you know, helping to support the college through recruitment, student retention, um, all of these public outreach programs. It was a ball. I actually have a photo here of where we were down and with the Southeast Conference of all the Ag Ambassadors through. Uh, so we were one of, I think, five schools that were 
actually in Orlando, touring different farming operations, working with different humanitarian activities. It was fantastic. Learning about all kinds of different things, as well as, again, remembering to give back to the community. I also had research lab experiences. Again, wonderful research mentors here uh, with Lumila Lapchik, who was a wonderful guiding mentor. Uh, I think many of my students today still hear some of her guiding words. And they're probably sitting there thinking like, where in the world did you learn that? I'm like, yeah, Lumila, Lumila says. Um, you know, so be sure and search out for those mentors who are going to be able to help you find where you want to wind up in life and who are going to encourage you. Uh, another one was Bill Witt, who was an extension professor. I was actually doing applied research and uh, ultimately weed being the, the type of plant you don't want to grow in different locations, weed science. Uh, and what we saw was you can take all of this app, this, all these applications, all of these real world needs, and you can do research in order to address them. I had a ball working with these individuals. They were fantastic. Um, and as well as uh, people that I worked with through my internship. So I interned with, and it's going to age me a little bit. Uh, this was before the mergers. I interned with Monsanto at the time, now Bayer. I uh, was working with their trade integration group. Uh, so actually looking at how you can integrate in new trades through uh, genetic modification in corn. And one of the mentors that I had that was amazing was Sherm Johnson, um, took, you know, took me under, the wing, under his wing and really kind of helped me walk through not just the science end of things, but also the uh, personal and interpersonal side of how you do research. Um, Jennifer Tardish-Steinke was a non, they're a wonderful individual that I worked with who really kind of took me under her wing, walked me through and put up with every single question, bless her heart, because I can ask a ton of them that I ever had about why are we doing this with plant breeding? Um, and still, I have a really good relationship with several of these individuals to this day, wonderful people who really were willing to help a student. So with that being said, one of the things that you do as a student is you make sure to build those relationships and ask questions because you will always learn from the people around you. And they usually love whenever they are able to teach somebody who is willing to learn. Um, so let's see. Take a pause real quick. Where have I learned the most as a student? You know, I, I learned a lot in the classroom. Classrooms are invaluable. You learn a ton through them, but that's not where you always are going to learn the most. Where I've learned the most are my applied experiences, whether it was an internship with uh, Monsanto, uh, now Bayer, or with at that time Pioneer Hybrid, now Corteva, um, or if it was a case where I was working on a research project with a professor or whatever the case might be, every single one of those was instrumental in teaching me how to be a plant breeder and a statistical geneticist because I was working with real data and actually large data sets. And what was interesting was that was not necessarily the goal of the project, but it was something I took on just as a, hey, I need a little bit of a project as a student. This looks cool. Let me, let me work on it. And I, because of this, I say I accidentally had data projects each time that I was working on these research projects with people, but it really was just meant to be. And I took the opportunity to work on those and gain those skills. So one of the big pieces of advice I have for students is take that initiative. Take that initiative to say, hey, I'll tackle that project or, hey, I want to learn those skills. And I may not know everything I need to at the top, you know, right off the top of my head, but I'm going to at least learn it. Um, you know, one of the things that I always grew up knowing was you're not going to know everything, but you might learn something. And so the best you can do is try and then reach out whenever things don't, you know, don't pan out and say, hey, I need a little bit of extra help and guidance and then keep on working at it. So that led me to grad school and the University of Illinois, where I do have I did earn a PhD in plant breeding and genetics. And again, I had wonderful mentors, amazing people who were able to help and guide me. Um, the first three individuals on the left hand side of the screen were are all plant breeders. And then the last one is a statistician. So Rita Mum, who is this individual right here, actually met with me whenever I was interning with Monsanto at that time, now Bayer, in Thomasboro, Illinois, or Platteville. And she was a professor at the University of Illinois and said, hey, whenever you get ready to graduate, 
let me know. I think I may have a project that you would be well suited for. And so we kept up that relationship and lo and behold, she actually convinced me to skip the whole master's, jump straight into a PhD and accelerate my career a little bit. She's like, you've got the research experiences from a master's. Let's go ahead and get you into PhD and get you working on this data project. I think you'll really enjoy it. I'm like, where did you get data from genetics? And she was like, I, I've watched everything you've done and everything you've done. Yeah, you, you love the genetics aspect, but you also love this really cool data aspect as well. And so she really took, you know, a strong mentoring relationship to me. Well, Rita had to retire, um, you know, unexpectedly. And the second individual here is actually my PhD advisor, a wonderful human being, wonderful mentor, Martin Bone. Um, it, insanely brilliant, taught me to think about research in a very different way. And one of the big things I remember thinking is like, oh, well, it's got to be this way. We got to work this way. And he's like, why? Well, because that's the way it's always been done. Why? And he taught me to question and to really think about and be intentional of what we were doing. And then always encouraged me to pick up these little bitty projects that are on the side. So he's like, you're going to learn skills that you're going to be able to use. Uh, the next individual, this is Fred or Dr. Fred Cole, wonderful mentor again, was always incredibly encouraging and said, hey, here's the real world application of what you're doing. And I know you're working in corn, but here's how you can also apply it in wheat. So I got to work with several different crops. And then the last individual here is Dr. Don Bullock, who was a wonderful statistician at the University of Illinois for many years. And what was really interesting is I, I of course, I had classes in stats. My, I actually had a minor in math and stats from the University of Kentucky. Uh, so I'm walking into the statistics class that Rita was making me take, thinking, why in the world is she making me take this? I've already had this. Well, I realized very quickly that what I knew about stats was good, but Dr. Bullock knew a ton more, and I was going to take everything that I knew about stats, throw it out the window, and I was going to learn even more and become a much better statistician. And he really was very encouraging to students and always encouraging the questions whenever they said, hey, I want to learn a little bit more. Again, that was what was really cool about every single one of these mentors that has encouraged me and supported me all along the way is they have been willing to take students under their wings who are wanting to ask questions, wanting to learn more. And so that's one of the big pieces of advice that I have for students is reach out to these mentors, work with them, be a face that they know. All right. So one of the things that I also have, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I ran into an issue with my PhD project that was not going to necessarily work out well for me. Um, we actually were afraid we might have to scrap the project and I might have to start all over again. So I said, you know, what, what, what's the worst I could do? I'm going to reach out to somebody and the worst thing can tell me is no. So I reached out to, at the time, Diagra Sciences um, in Indianapolis, Indiana, and now they're Corteva. And I said, hey, I've got this issue where I'm trying to do some chemical work or some biochemical work uh, and do some physiology work and the protocols are not working out. We don't have the equipment we need here at the university. Can you guys, you know, help give us some guidance, please? And they said, sure, but we need a guinea pig. Well, I reached out to you guys. Let's hear this. And what they did is they said, you know, we've been really wanting to work with PhD students before they graduate so that they can kind of see what it's like to work in industry. Tell me more. This sounds good so far. And they said, you know, instead, rather than us telling you how to do the protocol and you just running it there and us having to go back and forth potentially or us just running it for you, why don't you come over here? We'll show you how to run it. You'll actually get to work on real equipment. And if it works out, you know, hey, we know we now have a good mentoring program. Well, to somebody who is about ready to scrap her PhD project, this sounds like a fantastic alternative. And so I wound up going over to Indianapolis and living there for about a year and working as a visiting research scientist for Dow. And I worked in their analytical technologies laboratory group. Uh, so working with analytical chemistry techniques, biochemistry techniques, you name it. And somehow, just through conversations and everything else, I still managed to hang out with the data scientists who, because the way at the time the building was set up, Analytical Technologies was on one side of the floor. There was kind of this open area in between. And then the data scientists were on the other hallway. 
So you could actually just walk right across basically this crosswalk area and go talk to them. So I hung out with them and learned quite a bit too, because I'm like, you know, if I'm here, I might as well ask questions and learn. And it was fantastic. Learned so much from both of those groups and they were fantastic mentors. Um, one of the problems I do have with industry is unlike academia, they do not post their pictures on websites. So I don't have any pretty pictures to show you guys, but wonderful, wonderful, wonderful mentors there. And, you know, normally what would have happened is I would have tried to stay on in industry, but I graduated in 2016, which was about the same time that Dow and Pioneer announced that they were going to consolidate. So when companies start to consolidate and one of your teaching advisors, namely Don Bullock, happens to retire, there was a position that became available at the University of Illinois. And I owe so much to this individual right here. This is Dr. Herman Valero, who is now the Associate Dean of Mesas. He was at that time the department head for crop sciences. He reached out and he said, you know what? You've been teaching for me. You've taught almost all the stats classes here as a TA. Would you like a position? For somebody who is about to graduate, and who also is sitting there and is realizing that most of the companies are consolidating and they're in a hiring freeze. This sounds like a lovely idea. You know what? I get to teach classes I like. I was planning on retiring to academia eventually. I'll, we're just going to skip the whole industry process and start off with academia. Again, I owe so much to this human being. Um, wonderful, wonderful person to work for, wonderful advisor. And then I also had two additional people, in addition to everybody else I've been working with, at the University of Illinois, who were wonderful mentors to a young faculty member, those being Maria Villanil, who is this individual right here, and Fred Bilo, who took me under their wing and said, hey, you know, you, you know how to do the teaching, you know how to do the research, we're going to show you how to run a program now, and we're going to walk you through that and help support you. So, as a faculty member at the University of Illinois, I was a biostatistician. So I've been working in plant breeding and genetics, had my PhD in it, had been doing all the statistics and data analysis work on the side, and somehow managed to find myself in a biostatistics role. Well, what I did is I taught courses in applied statistics. I helped others in the department analyze their data, and it was fantastic. I was always learning something because they would walk into my office, or their students would walk into my office and say, well, what is it that, you know, how do I analyze this? I've never seen this before. It's not in a textbook. I'm like, you know what? It's not in a textbook, but let me figure it out. And so I was always learning these new tools and techniques. Um, and always, I felt like figuring out how to build a better, better mousetrap and make things more efficient. And what was interesting was all of these experiences really helped me as well as helping those individuals because I was learning things that can't be taught in a textbook. Um, you know, because data science and data analytics at the advanced level really just can't be. You have to learn through experience. And so take those opportunities as they present themselves to gain skill sets in areas that you have an interest in. And of course, I was still doing research in statistical genetics. And just uh, to show you guys, at this point in time, this sweatshirt's probably about 10, 15 years old, but I still have my FFA sweatshirts from high school and they are wonderful work shirts. So if you all ever wanna see what a plant breeding field looks like, this is it at harvest time. We have our tags, we have all of our ears that we're harvesting at the end of each row. And what we would do is then we'd come in and we would look at the corn. For me, I work in corn quality. So things like mycotoxin contamination, um, different nutrient concentrations, um, corn quality in terms of, are we necessarily having really good concentrations of these healthy chemicals versus um, you know, lesser concentrations of you know, nutrients that could be used in diets or as dietary supplements. So we'd look at that at the very end and be able to trace it back to these individual plots in the field. All right, so all of this being said, I, I still feel like a jack of all trades in many ways, you know, I, I, and I was kind of irritated about it, to be honest with you. You know, what was interesting though, as I look back on it now, so here I am, here's my winding path. I'm taking all these little random opportunities to try to better myself and I'm still feeling irritated because I'm like, I'm just a jack, you know, I'm jack of all trades, a master of none. I couldn't see how all those were gonna be coming together yet. And, you know, one of the big things that I will say is that I constantly had mentors all along the way that were very supportive and helpful. And I was always watching and learning from them. And what really helped out, and I didn't realize it at the time, is you never know who's going to be watching you. 
two of those faculty members that I mentioned from U of I reached out specifically because they were watching me interact with other individuals. And they said, hey, I think you have potential, uh, which was fantastic. I, again, I could not have done it without those strong mentorship relationships. So one of the other pieces of advice I have is that I, I never stopped learning or taking random opportunities. And I think it's because of something I was taught at a very early age. Uh, so my dad was actually, I'm from Kentucky. My dad actually worked at a rock quarry uh, for many, many years. And he had a foreman at one time that had told all the guys on his crew, said, you know what, once you, and thank you was implied, once you think you know everything there is to know about something, it's time to hang up your hard hat and go home and learn something else. And what I've realized over the years is you'll never know everything, but you will be gaining little pieces of this, that, and the other, and being able to apply them in new ways and really be able to pivot yourself into careers or into positions that are going to better you. So again, I had a ball working for the U of I. I loved it, loved the area, loved the people. So the question becomes, well, why did you leave? Well, in January, 2019, SIUE, which is of course who I work with now, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, opened up a search for a director of their new Center for Predictive Analytics or CPAN for short. And, you know, my husband's from this area. I'm from Western Kentucky, would have been closer to family. And the position was very similar to what I had been doing. So I said, you know what, let's just put in for it. Let's see what happens. Now, by this point, I'm not all that old. By this point, though, I had 16 years of experience of working with data and record intensive research. And it seems crazy. It really does. But those skills that I was using back in high school, I still use every single day as a data scientist, you know, plus a lot more, obviously. I've learned a few more skills along the way. But I always go back to those same basic skills as well. And I had a ton of other random winding experiences, it seemed like, that made it possible for me to talk to a variety of people. That jack of all trades thing I was mentioning, well, I've never met a stranger now. It feels like I can talk to people in a lot of different disciplines. And so I was able to take this career in digital agriculture and expand it to where I'm now working on all kinds of projects. I get to work with all kinds of data sets. I have things where I'm working with public health data sets. I'm working with COVID. I'm working with data sets uh, with the state of Illinois. I'm working with student success data sets, all kinds of fun things. Um, you know, one of the things I go back to uh, Dr. Valero, who again was a very good mentor of mine, told me was data is data and tools are tools pretty much. Um, you know, all the X's go on the X side of the equation, all the Y's go on the Y side of the equation. It doesn't matter if you're working in agriculture or if you're working in human health. They are really transferable. And I always loved learning new tools and techniques, and I get to do that every day in my job now. Now, of course, I still get to work in ag projects. Um, I, I love that area, and thank goodness I have a boss that's very supportive of me continuing that research on. Um, and I also get to work with students because I get to teach. I get to have research programs that I oversee as well as internships that I oversee. I get to interact with usually somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 research interns or research students every year. And I also have training programs and workshops that I oversee and that we're continuing to build and start up, especially in ag that we will soon be offering statewide. So, what kind of projects do I get to work on? Again, ag, crop modeling, statistical genetics, all the things I love and got to work on at U of I. Um, and now I also get to incorporate sensor data into all that, so drone data. Uh, I get to do training in data science education, uh, especially in the food, agricultural, and environmental sciences, but data science education in general. I get to work on health and public health data sets, a um, couple of them that I didn't mention in addition to COVID. I'm working on Parkinson's, cancer, housing, and socioeconomic factors. If it's a data point, you name it, I get to work on it. Uh, we're working on cyber infrastructure training and how to navigate the data landscape and help people make use of all these cool tools that are becoming available. And there are tons of collaborative projects that I get to work on. And because of that, people that I'm still learning from. So some of my favorite uh, collaborators on campus are actually pictured to the right. And part of the reason for that is I'm always learning from them. They have some really, really, really cool, exciting research that's going on. And we get to work together and it's really a team effort. So here's the secret code for the gamification part of the presentation, digital ad careers. 
And with all that being said, I've got a few minutes where whenever I was uh, actually putting this together, uh, the organizers mentioned, hey, can you put together a little bit about SIUE? Because there may be some students who are interested in about it. Sure. Now, let me also say this. All the public schools in Illinois, fantastic. I know I'm biased, but they're wonderful. Now, obviously, I work for SIUE, so I'm going to brag on them. And I, I will also mention, too, you know, whenever you're looking at different universities, different institutions, go where the good fit is. Go where you feel most comfortable. I, I'll be flat out and honest. I went to the University of Illinois, had a wonderful experience as a student there. My husband went to SIUE, had a wonderful experience as a student here. Both very good schools. Um, and I love working for this institution. So let me brag on it. Uh, it is a nationally accredited institution with a low student to faculty ratio. That means that there's a lot of face to face interaction. Uh, if you look at other institutions across the state, that student faculty ratio is usually a little bit higher. So that means that you have more one on one time potential with your professors. There are 13,000 students, so it's a little bit smaller, but not too small at about 350 areas of study that are all accredited. Now, I will also say this, one of the huge bragging points, and I think so that's really cool about SIUE is all of the STEM, so your science, technology, engineering, and math programs, as well as the business programs are excellently supported and have wonderful ties across the river and the St. Louis area. So we're only about 20 minutes from St. Louis, um, well, 30 minutes if you wanna get to the other side. Uh, really, really, really good, strong ties. And for somebody who's looking for applied experiences, great opportunity for that. 90% uh, of SIUE grads that we have surveyed after they graduated reported securing a job or continuing their education within a year of graduating. That's pretty good. That means that you're not potentially going to be getting a job at, or getting a degree and not being able to do anything with it. Have a pretty reasonable tuition, um, tuition and fees together. Annually cost about $12,219. Now, I'm going to be completely and totally honest, that does not include room and board. So if you are going to be looking at institutions, remember to factor that in if you're going to be moving potentially. Uh, and then we also have very close partnerships with all of the community colleges in Illinois, but uh, especially SWIC, Lincoln Land, and Lewis and Clark. And every single one of the community colleges, especially those, have transfer plans to SIUE. And you can find those here at this link if anybody is interested. Uh, there are also plenty of research and internship opportunities. We have the Undergraduate Research and Creative Activities Program, uh, or IRCA, where we give all of our students research experience. We have the Student Career Center. So one of the internship programs that's run out of my office, the Data Science Internship Program, or DSI. Uh, we actually work with the Student Career Center to where not only do our students get internship credit, they actually get that on their transcript as well. And so they get, it on the, get to put it on the resume as well as on their transcript, which isn't always a thing. Uh, let's see, you also have here five state recognized research centers. That's pretty cool. There are a lot of research centers out there, but not every single one of them is state recognized. And one of those state recognized centers is also nationally recognized. Um, we have independent internships that we can offer with and help place people in because, again, we're really close to St. Louis, but we work with Chicago, we work with Springfield, we're, we work with everybody to try to make sure we place our students as quickly as possible. Uh, and again, because we are so close to St. Louis, there are plenty of those internship co-op and job opportunities for students, but we're still a pretty small town. And a relatively safe campus. We're always consistently ranked top 15 in the nation for safety. But those are those are the big bragging points that campus loves us to talk about. I'm also going to mention a couple of things that I think are probably the biggest selling points for SIUE and things that I absolutely love about it. Uh, this campus has a culture of caring. We actually really, really do care about our students and, and are intentional about that caring. So we have a student success center. Uh, I actually work with them and the Ezra Research Center to do student success and make sure that we are supporting our students the best we can through you know, tracking uh, students, seeing if there are times when we need to intervene, if there are support structures that we need to implement across campus, all kinds of things. We actually really do care. Our faculty members do that intentionally in their classes as well. We also have ample student organizations on campus. So for me, somebody who, you know, as a hiring manager, I'm not looking just at your uh, resume to see, or your transcript, I'm also looking at your resume to see what your experiences are. 
And I, I can tell you, hands down, those student organizations, those research experiences are what really help get you hired on to a job uh, later on. So we have plenty of those where people can get their feet wet. So let's talk about, uh, you know, kind of real quick elephant in the room. We are talking about agriculture today and agricultural careers. Now, if you went to SIUE, we don't technically have an ag degree, but what we do have is we have a really wonderful engineering program, a fantastic business program, and a fantastic biology, chemistry, and environmental science, uh, well, those three programs. So we have ample opportunities for our students to take, get a degree in those areas, and then go work in agriculture. And I'll, I'll give you a personal story for that one, too. Um, as an example, my husband, I, again, he graduated from SIUE uh, and actually graduated in engineering. What was interesting was while we were up in the Champaign area, he was working as an engineer for an ag company and was loving it and was well prepared for it. No problems whatsoever. So that is a possible route. No problem at all. Uh, we also do wind up placing a lot of our biology, chemistry and environmental science students uh, working with potentially the bears of the world. Um, and Heiser Bushes of the world. So there's plenty of pathways for our students into ag if that is something you would like to consider. All right, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you guys so much for your attention today and for attending. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I put my email on this slide. Uh, most unfortunate maiden last name ever, unfortunately, uh, but it is cbutsw at siue.edu. And I also put some really uh, helpful links if anybody is interested about SIUE and learning a little bit more about the campus. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, and I do want to note too, I put in the chat the link to our Careers Palooza page. And so you'll be able to, under the, the same spot where you joined for the live session, you'll see that there's a link for Carrie's presentation slides. So you can download those and have access to all of those links on there as well. Um, and so I'm not seeing any questions coming through the chat, but Carrie, I do have a question for you. So let's say I'm a sophomore or junior, maybe even a senior in high school, and I'm not quite sure what that next path looks like for me, whether I want to go on and get, um, you know, my, my bachelor's degree or maybe go to a community college or maybe even start working right away. So as someone who's, who's kind of experienced that and moving through that path, what would be sort of your advice to, to students who are just kind of unsure of what, what that next step is for them? Yeah, great question. For me, you know, and of course, if you're a senior and you're graduating, you gotta make a decision a little bit quicker. But for me, as somebody who was, you know, thank heavens had a chance to get into research and get into a career in high school. If you're that sophomore, junior, start taking advantage of those opportunities now, because that'll guide you a little bit. Um, and one of the things I will say is if the longer break you take, the harder it is to go back. Um, We've, we've seen this constantly. I'm not saying it can't be done, but if you do take a break and go off, go work for a little bit, it seems like it's a little bit harder to get back into school later on and ultimately get a degree. Again, not saying it can't be done. And one of the things you could do is something that seems like it has a really good success rate. Is since you have some very basic courses, you got to get out of the way, so your gen ed requirements, one of the things you could do if you're uncertain is go to a college that has a certification program. So many of our community colleges do have a very good certification program, um, especially in ag careers. And get your gen eds out of the way, get a certification in a area of interest to you. And then if you decide you wanna go on and get a four-year degree, then you can, you can transfer easily from the uh, to your institution. So from your community college to a four-year institution, because we do have transfer plans. Or if you decide, you know, I want to stop with just my certification, I'm good with this, then you can, you know, stop right there. You've got your two years, you've got your post uh, high school training out of the way, and you've got something to show for it. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you for sharing sort of um, your path and how you got to where you are. I think it was great information. And hopefully some of our, our students can relate or, you know, can hear the importance of, you know, asking those questions and dual credit and really finding those those mentors that can be helpful and assistant to to them when it comes to figuring out what next steps are. Um, Cause it can be a little daunting when you're, when you're a senior in high school, you feel like you have to figure it all out right then. Um, but it's okay to ask questions and, and take your time and kind of try things out along the way as well. So again, Carrie, thank you so much for everyone participating today. Um, like I said, this is recorded and we will be posting it up on the Plusa website here in a few hours. And be sure to check back with us again at 11 o'clock tomorrow for our last live session of the Palooza. And all of the resources and on-demand videos will be continued to be linked and shared on that web page um, for you to utilize when, whenever you so choose. So thank you all for participating today. And thank you again, Carrie. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it.